sewers and sewer water. So uh, to quote Mike Rowe, I'm just the guy looking up from the sewer. So uh, perhaps I'll show you how we'll get to the, to the real bottom of costs here and try to do some meaningful research. So my, my topic today addresses the issue of uh, motivating people to go to Mars. And we're all here today because we know why we want to go to Mars, but there, there might be some other reasons why we want to go to Mars, and that's what I'm going to talk about today a little bit. I'm not going to get into a lot of details uh, about terraforming or the mechanics of closed ecological life support systems. Yes? Okay. Yeah. I'm not going to uh, get into the mechanics of closed uh, uh, life, uh, controlled ecological life support systems, but I am going to pro propose a rationale for developing a certain kind of cells uh, that will be effective. Next slide. For this purpose, which is, which is uh, lifespan extension. So the basic idea is that we can and will establish habitats on a planetary surface where the essential conditions for a sustainable life will be enabled by uh, the, the necessities of the mission and the isolation of it. So in other words, we're going to have to be very selective when we put there how we set up our systems and how we operate them. So I'll just cue that, please. You may, re you may recall, I said, some of you have been around long enough to, rem to remember what may have originally excited you about Mars, and, and I think this is my, my excitement. This is a clip from the 1957 Disney film, Mars and Beyond. Uh, and it goes to the whole history of the universe, sorry without a big bang, <laughs> but it, it does talk about the infinity of the universe and how there is uh, the possibility of life uh, beyond imagination uh, out there, and uh, the only question is how to get it from in here to out there. So in time, we'll discover that, uh, that in fact, uh, we have limited ourselves on Earth. Uh, Earth is limited by uh, accumulation of toxins, uh, the accumulation of things in our, in our food supply that are deleterious to our health. And so I'm, I'm going to get to that today. And if you could push that forward to nine minutes, uh, we probably can't hear that. But. The narrator is pointing out that there are three planets within the Goldilocks zone. They, they just call it the Golden Zone back then. Venus, Earth, and Mars. And uh, Venus is still uh, inscrutable, so far as we can do in terms of habitation. But if we get out to Mars, that seems like a reasonable place to establish a habitat and a possible post-Earth civilization, if not one that is parallel to Earth civilization. And the thing about, the thing about, uh, about their recognition, even in the, in the 1950s, is that we'll outgrow our limits in some form or another, and we'll have to go there, and we'll be able to establish uh, through, through proper um, development of a habitat on Mars, a livable community for people like you and me. Let's go to the next slide. So what we know already about from genetic studies, laboratory studies, and clinical studies is that a healthy body has the capacity to maintain itself uh, and repair itself. But the, but the systems we have today, our, our physiological status, is limited for some reason. We, we live our, our sick day, our three score in 10 or 20 years, and we're finished. And it's a little bit of a puzzle once you look at the physiological machinery that is in, pay, in place inside our, everyone's body, in fact, from every form of life on up, uh, why this happens. Uh, because a healthy immune system minimizes uh, the load on the uh, repair replacement systems by preventing uh, introduction of toxins and the deleterious microbes or opportunistic organisms into uh, into our circulating system. Next slide. I heard about this uh, experiment on uh, Radio Lab about about an experiment with uh, C. elegans, and this is some of the graphs from that paper. I don't have a pointer, so I'll use a finger. 
if you uh, if, if, if you can have it, if you develop a C uh, C elegant uh, elegant, then you see uh, C elegant is a is a nematode, it's a small, almost microscopic worm that uh, that is used for a lot of experiments. has has a quick life. Its average lifespan is perhaps 30 to 35 days. And uh, you know, in, in its wild form, it uh, it feeds in nature, but it's not normally uh, does not normally use glucose uh, raw glucose as uh, you know as a food source. But in the laboratory experiment that these researchers perform, they use a 0.2 percent solution of glucose as a feedstock. Uh, in a bacterial field, which is which is their normal uh, uh, feedstock, the name of bacteria. So they, they found that consistently, that the the the, um, the lifespan of C. elegans was reduced on this glucose regimen. It was reduced from an average of 35 days to around 20 days. And uh, you can see here in the second um, stack chart the ratio of glucose to protein. You know, as the, as the ratio of glucose went up, the protein being the cell uh, in the diet went up uh, on the brown lines once again. That uh, uh, the lifespan was limited, so they, they they're able to engineer C. elegans in such a way that they can be tell they can tell which genes are being active and deactivated. But what happens with glucose is that it uh, deactivates a, a, a certain gene, TAF. 16, I think they call it, that is responsible for cellular repair mechanisms. And in C. elegans, where uh, this gene is deactivated, uh, the cell can no longer manage uh, glucose properly. Yeah, it's, uh, uh, and, it, uh, and it shortens the lifespan of cell, but the cell apoptosis occurs more quickly and the cell dies. And however, if they, if they uh, if, in, in C. elegans, where they have this uh, um, a super deck, uh, uh, they can actually lengthen the lifespan. You can see up here that uh, they're actually extending the lifespan here out to 40 days by enhancing the activity of this, uh, uh, you know, the, of this gene, this gene of which is, which uh, controls the pathways that that. Uh, um, take care of the cellular machinery. Next slide, please. So this is a little diagram about, about how, how all this works because the, the glucose is absorbed through the cell membrane and reacts, uh, 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 results in uh, reactive oxygen species. That's the ROS. And the, the, uh, it's, the insulin signaling is required to release insulin, but it competes with the activity of the gene that does the repairs. So. Uh, in the presence of glucose, that uh, those genes are uh, the insulin receptor DAF2 is activated, which uh, causes the, the, the cell to to manage the glucose, but not its own repair mechanism. So next slide. Okay, so a controlled ecological life support system for Mars, like any other cells, whether it's in space or on a planetary surface, will will, will have essential use usual essential elements, air and water, nutrients, waste, uh, handling energy, in input, management, and cooling. Next slide. So um, the large separation of space between Earth and Mars will both necessitate and enable, and enable provisions of conditions for indefinitely sustainable human life on Mars is, is my hypothesis. Next slide. So, you know, Mars uh, in in, uh, in literature and media has uh, has uh, has felt a, a mixed uh, audience over the days from writers uh, in War of the Worlds. Uh, unfriendly creatures come to Earth and uh, they almost conquer Earth, but they're nearly but they're finally overwhelmed by resident microbes. Next next slide. We'll just flip through these real fast. So in Disney's version, some autonomous fungus-like creatures are already present on Mars. They get themselves, next slide, they get themselves suited up. They come to Earth, next slide. They start zapping the local residents, uh, next slide. But then near the end of their conquest, they start feeling woozy. And finally, next slide, they get a big swollen head. And next slide, they collapse, they fall apart and collapse. So next slide. 
Dr. Martin Blazer, the head of the uh, uh, U.S. Uh, Human Microbiome Project, has extensively studied uh, the uh, a natural population of microbes, which, which, if you will, defeated the Martians in the War of the, War of the Worlds. And what he has found is that we are overwhelming our natural defenses through the uh, overuse of antibiotics. So nowadays, uh, many of us who have who've used antibiotics uh, simply have a compromised immune system because our natural defenses have been, have been reduced. Uh, antibiotics, uh, broad spectrum antibiotics uh, are very effective in the first place, but Dr. Blazer and his research, uh, and in this book, uh, presents all the, all the evidence that see, uh, uh, subsequent uh, infections are far more likely. For example, in salmonella, a normal individual takes typically 100,000 salmonella to create an infection. But after the, uh, some weeks after the use of antibiotics, only three or four salmonella can create an outbreak. Uh, Dr. Alejandro Younger, I, I, I love showing book covers because you can get these at the bookstore and you don't, you don't have to research this online if, you don't, if you're not in that room, you just go buy a book. Uh, Dr. Alejandro Younger uh, has described in detail uh, how our gut operates and what, uh, uh, what's, what's being compromised inside our gut. This is a compromised gut. This is, uh, this is in, it turns out that many of us have this condition. Uh, this is called uh, simply a leaky gut, or it's more technically the hyperporosity of the intestinal lumen. And you have all kinds of stuff going on here because what's happened as a result of antibiotic usage is that there's been a fungal overgrowth. The, the, the fungus or yeast that's always there overgrows and becomes a nasty Martian invader. As you see over here, <laughs> pretty much looks like the ones that Disney drew. Uh, those are actually viruses released by funguses. And so they are able to penetrate into, uh, into, the, into the voids or gaps in the intestinal lining uh, created by the, uh, by, by, by the yeast overgrowth and the fungal overgrowth. So the, the intestinal gills become eroded, undigested food particles, polypeptides, parasites, and other things uh, get into the blood system and you can only guess what, that, what, what happens in that area. Next slide. Uh, but uh, Dr. Mueller shows us that by taking the appropriate dietary action, detoxification, promote healing, restoring intestinal flora that control opportunistic species, including fungus, the gut can become whole again. Uh, the, these junctures are tightened up again. Uh, there's no longer any uh, challenge to the immune system or the associated inflammation caused by the introduction of the spore material, bacteria, fungus, and so forth. Next slide. Um, this is a recent article in Science, a, a sub-article. Vomiting, anxiety, blackouts, anyone? Are you sure you want to go into space? Because this is what people, uh, this is what people going into space experience. Next slide. What we know about for traveling anywhere in space is that bone demineralization and calcium loss are our problem. Uh, calcium, excess calcium in the system also relates to the, to the sudden vomiting effect because the over, when, the, when the fluid shift occurs, the, the calcium receptors in the brain respond to that and, and uh, uh, through, a, through a, uh, a reflex response causes the stomach to empty. Another problem is biological sensitivity to space ionizing radiation. Next slide. And this corresponds to problems we have commonly in our health, in our population here on Earth: bone demineralization and calcium loss, which is, uh, you know, uh, uh, otherwise known as uh, osteocannulating to osteoporosis, and sensitivity to free radicals or toxins. That's the, you know, the chemicals that are in our food, the ethyl benzene, benzene with. You know, uh, with apologies to the petrochemical industry next door in Houston, in Houston Harbor. Uh, next slide. So what we what we know is that, uh, is that the, the blood pH must be maintained in the body a slight alkaline pH of 7.3 to 7.4. And most food items are acidic or acid producing when digested. So in the absence of uh, Green leafy vegetables and other alkalinizing factors, the body removes calcium from the bones to neutralize the acids. Okay, so now there's a study going on next door here at the Johnson Space Flight Center. 
All right, so this guy's working on things to help us uh, with the things that the petrochemical industry introduces. This is Scott Smith and Sarah Ward. Um, my company made a proposal in 1986 to, to study the relationship between acid and acid in the diet, made mostly proteins and, and calcium bone loss. It was rejected at that time uh, because um, Dr. Schneider uh, there uh, said he, he didn't think it was a valid phenomenon. But since that time, they've studied it and it's been validated. And currently, uh, Scott Smith and Sarah's work are finalizing the results from the International Space Station uh, with a pro K experiment. You can look it up on ISS experiments to see uh, as the results come in. And Scott, on a NASA TV interview, did, did say that it, it looked positive so far. It's just that the astronauts, when they got off the pro K environment, uh, off the pro K diet, said, gee, I'm sure I'm glad I'm on a no K diet. K for potassium. Potassium is uh, alkalized. Next slide. And this is just uh, uh, you know, a copy of their stuff, this one. OK, so neutral pH, proper function of body's hormones and enzymes are highly pH dependent. And so uh, we need, these, these are the things that we need for proper sort of function. The internal environment that is less terrible than micro. So there's, there's a, a uh, I don't have time today, but uh, if anyone is interested, I'll bring a pH paper bottle down for you. Because you can buy these at the vitamin shop or eight stores, and you can test your urine and saliva pH in the morning and see if you fit into the acid category. Next slide. And next slide. And the other thing you can do is, is uh, in my neighborhood, we can get a $35 live blood cell test and, and look for these things in our, in our, blood, in our blood samples. The technician takes a drop of blood and he looks at the funguses. And you can't see viruses in a microscope slide, uh, fake contrast. But you can see funguses, you can see uric acid crystals, and you can see damaged red blood cells due to oxidation. Next slide. Just, just go through those. Just flip, 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 flip. Go ahead. OK, so conclusion, uh, special condition for life extension cells on Mars. Maintain physiological balance with pH and air neutrality, 7.3 to 7.4. Minimize release of man-made toxins and waste. Maintain notobiotic senses of all organisms. We can establish the conditions that will limit the organisms that can survive on Mars, Mars being originally aseptic. So we can create the conditions that are favorable to our, our, our organism and our endosymbionts that support our, support our life, the intestinal flora, for example. Uh, maintain our semipermeal membranes at appropriate levels of porosity. But they should only, your, 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 your gut should only allow amino acids and mineral supplements and a few other things in. Grow and maintain foods high in macro and phytonutrients. Next slide. Uh, this, uh, Joe Robinson has written this book, Eating on the Wild Side, and she describes all the things that we should be growing on Mars. They are, they are the, the original uh, uh, food of this planet when we were a hunter-gatherer society. They're uh, the typical um, pre-agricultural uh, plant uh, used for food purposes is high in phytonutrients, high in protein, uh, and high in fiber. Uh, unfortunately, all that's been bred out by agricultural needs, and even the flavor has been removed. But she has excellent tips on things you can still get in the supermarket and which we can take to Mars with us uh, to, to, to get ourselves into a favorable environment to have unlimited lifespan. Or, shall I say, uh, not predetermined lifespan. <laughs> Next slide. So, can we, do it, uh, can we get healthy enough to go to Mars? Can we get healthy enough to even stay on Earth? The answer most definitely. Why not? There's an axiom uh, called the Hermetic Axiom of Ancient Science, which is still true today, as, above, as, as it is above, so it is below and within. Next slide. Uh, and no, uh, no presentation on cells would be uh, complete without paying homage to V.I. Bernatsky, uh, who wrote in the early 20th century, Biosphere. He's the one who first used the term. And uh, in the preface, uh, the, the, the uh, preface in the uh, Author says, what Darwin did for all life through time, Bernatsky did for all life through space. Because what he did, is that last slide? No, there's one more. One more slide. Yeah. What Bernatsky said, said is that life is essential to the universe. It's, it's not an epiphenomenal, it's not an accident of nature, it's hard life. 
So I leave you with this uh, curiosity. The ancient yin yang symbol, which uh, according to the experts is, uh, is related to pH. Um, and the uh, Wilkinson microwave and isotopy probe, dipole map, which to me looks very similar. It looks like the universe is divided into slightly different um, levels of the microwave background, which very much looks like the yin yang symbol. So there's something to Bernanke, and there's something, there's something very important to the, the essentials of, of pH and, and life maintenance, which we can and will set up on Mars. Thank you for listening today. If you're interested in more information about this, we have a, a, a standing committee now, well, it's an operating committee that's in the NSS called the Space Settlers Health Development Committee, and um, my dear wife, Amparo, has a list where it's up here now, I guess. Pass around and put down your, if you want more information about this, uh, write your name and, and contact information, and we'll get back to you. Thank you.